Facebook. Help me get the word out. Let's go ahead and start. So let's pray. Father, right now, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this time for us to gather together in your name. Father, you said, behold, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So right now, Father, we make a decision that we want to be unified. And I thank you. There's an anointing that's being released. I thank you that the anointing is free to flow. And I thank you, Father, that not only is the anointing free to flow, but I thank you that you command a blessing in that place. So, Father, right now, by faith, I consecrate myself to you. And I pray that I'll speak as your oracle. I pray I'll speak with the ability you've given me. And I'm asking God that I'll minister with the ability you've given me. And I pray that you'll give me the tongue to learn. That I shall speak a word in due season to those who are weary. Father, I'm praying that you'll make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. And I'm praying that I'll write on the tablets of the minds and the hearts of those under my voice. Father, as I just surrender, I depend upon you. I glory not in my, my own gift, but I glory in what, who you say I am. I thank you that you say I'm a prophet in your kingdom. So I'm praying today that people will leave knowing they heard God. And I'm praying that people will get the necessary impartation through this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glory to God. So we're talking about newness of life. We're going to be talking about newness of life. So we're going to go to um, Romans chapter six. We're talking about newness of life. It's something that the Holy Spirit began to deal with my heart about this morning. Um, when I woke up after this afternoon, when I woke up, he began to deal with my heart. And, you know, and there's a lot of things that are in the works, especially for 2017. You know, one of the things the Lord recently told me is that uh, um, doors are going to begin to open in 2017. As it relates to um, traveling, as it relates to ministry, um, the Lord already has made a way where well, a door has, has just recently opened for me to go speak somewhere in 2017. So it's a lot that God has in the works. And not only there's a lot that God has in the works in that vein, but also the things that God is, is um, revealing about um, how to position yourself for 2017. So there's some things we're going to be talking about, about how to position yourself. But there's some things that God's going to do. And you're going to have to be in the right position to properly receive what God is doing, you know, because... If God is doing something and you're not in position, you'll miss the move of God. So my purpose, you know, one of the things that I really want to stress to you guys <clears throat> is I want to make sure that you don't miss the move of God. There's a tremendous move of God that's coming in 2017, and there's a tremendous outpouring and release of the Spirit that's going to come forth in 2017. And it's going to be very important that you're, going, that you're in a proper position, or if not, you're going to be in the same spot. You know, the worst thing that can happen for you in 2017 is it ends and you're the same person. And, you know, um, we we'll believe in God that, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that God's going to do. And once we, once 2017, you know, comes, I'm going to be, be releasing some of the things that God has said he's going to do. There's some things that God specifically is saying he's going to do in 2017. So I don't want to just tell you what God is doing, but I also, I want you guys to be aware. Hey, how you doing, Shay? I want you to be aware of how to position yourself to receive because it's no good to know what God is doing if you're out of position. There's a lot of things that God is going to do that you're going to miss. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are going to miss. So I just, I pray that you guys don't, uh, no, I don't. I don't. Um, you got, I pray that you guys are in proper position. So let's, let's go ahead and open up. We're talking about newness of life. We're talking about newness of life. Why is this important? The Bible says in first and second Corinthians five seventeen. the Bible says, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Old things passed away. All things are new and all things of God. One more time. I say, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are new. All things are of God. And the Bible tells us this. The Bible says, behold, I do a new thing. Am I right about it? And he says, before it springs forth, I will tell you of it. And there's a lot of us, we're actually missing what God is doing because we have old wine skins. The Bible says that if you try to put new wine into old wine skins, they'll burst. And how is that relevant for our generation? What does that mean? It means that we're trying to walk in our new inheritance with the old man. But the Bible says that if you're going to get to where God has for you to go, the Bible says you're going to have to put off the old man and put on the new man. So as, as a believer, we're going to have to learn how to walk in this new man. Am I right about it? Because if you're trying to walk in the old man, that's why a lot of you guys are not experiencing success because you're trying to either please God in the flesh or you don't even know what the new man is. Am I right about it? The Bible tells us in, in Colossians chapter three, the Bible tells us to put away the old man. It has lying and anger and malice and evil speaking and etc. But it says put on the new man. What is the new man? 
the new man, the Bible says that you have received a new man that's been recreated in true knowledge of him that called you. So I want you to be aware that your new man is the spirit. Your new man is your new creation spirit. Your new man is that born again spirit that the breath of God has been breathed into your body and you've been made alive to God and dared to sin. And you have received a new man, but the old man is that flesh. And what begins to happen is a lot of believers don't know how to live out of their spirit, but they still live out of their flesh. And what they're trying to do, they actually begin to try to please God in the flesh. And they, they feel guilty. They feel condemned. They feel like it's never good enough because the Bible tells us that those that are in the flesh cannot please God because the flesh is incapable of doing the will of God. So we're going to have to learn how to put off this old man of the flesh and put on this new man of the spirit. And if we put on this new man of the spirit, then we'll begin to experience newness of life. There's a new life that God has called you to. And if you're going to begin to operate in this new life, you're going to have have to live out of your spirit. You know, there was a time in my youth where I would force an individual to want God, but I began to realize this. Life has a way of helping people want God. Am I right about it? Those who are old, though, you know, those mothers, you know, if you understand, I want you to come in, but life has a way of helping people want God because when you go against God's order, when you go against God's domain, when you go against God's way of doing things, your life begins to break down. And a lot of us have suffered breakdowns in life because we don't do it God's way. Like I, as you begin to live, you begin to see that there's no shortcuts. There's no way around doing the will of God. Because when you don't do the will of God, you give the devil license to dominate and rule in your life. When you don't do the will of God, you give the devil the license to operate in your life. There's a lot of us that are trying to get the devil out of our lives, but there are things we won't deal with about ourselves. There are things we won't address about ourselves. There are things we won't let go about about ourselves. There are sins that we're that we're in love with. There are sins that we won't let go of. Am I right about it? There, there are weights that we're gonna we're carrying. Am I right about it? But we're gonna have to get to a place where if we want to experience the fullness of God, because a lot of people don't even know what the fullness of God is, but the Bible says, of his fullness have we received. Jesus had, the Bible says, the fullness of God dwells in him bodily. Jesus had the fullness of the Godhead in him bodily. And the Bible says, of his fullness have we all received. God wants his people to be glorious examples of the grace of God. And you will never walk in fullness as long as you're okay with measure. And there's a lot of believers that are comfortable with measure. You're complacent. You're okay where you are. You're not really studying God. You're not really thinking about God. You're not really concerned with your purpose, you're not really concerned with your destiny, and your life is suffering tremendously. On the outside, yeah, it look good, you look like ain't nothing going on, yeah, yeah, all that, but in your heart, you feel dissatisfied, in your heart, you feel disillusioned, in your heart, you feel like nothing is working out. Why? Because you're out of the will of God. So if we're going to walk in newness of life, I want to talk about this newness of life, because if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, all things are new, and all things are of God. It's going to be very important, saints, that you become re -educated educated as to what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Listen to me, the, the closer you stay to the cross, that's what a power is. Any individual that espouses to have power without the cross is a witch or warlock. I want you to be aware because you don't have power in yourself. There's a lot of people that, 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 that espouse to have this deep power. Am I right about it? But my issue is who's sourcing you? Who's the source of your power? Because, you know, there are illegitimate sources of power. Ask Simon the sorcerer. Am I right about it? They thought this man was God until they met the real thing. And some of you are going to encounter people that really know God. And when you see a person that really knows God, that really walks in power, the Bible says that they had they almost worshipped. They worshipped Simon the sorcerer. Am I right about it? And the Bible says that when Paul came, even this, this sorcerer, he began to realize, hey, man, my power source is off. And this man said, hey, I want to buy. I want to buy this power. He said, I want to buy this power. And then that, that's when he was hit. He was judged by God because he thought he can purchase the power of God with money. Am I right about it? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Watch this. So we're talking about newness of life. I want you to understand that once you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings the ability to have a new life. The Holy Spirit brings the ability to have a new life. Listen to me good. 
The Holy Spirit brings the ability to have new life. Am I right about it? The Holy Spirit brings the kingdom of God inside of you. You have a kingdom within you. Listen to me good. The kingdom of God does not come by observation. Am I right about it? You're waiting for a, you're waiting for the day. Baby, there are too many people. You're waiting for the day when Jesus breaks the sky. Am I right about it? You're looking to the heavens and you're waiting for Jesus to break the sky. You're waiting for that, that perusia. You're waiting for him to appear on the clouds with thousands of his saints. You're waiting to see that, that angel begin to, um, you're waiting to see that angel begin to shout, um, use the trumpet. Am I right about it? Baby, heaven is waiting for Jesus to awaken in you because listen to me good. Jesus is inside of you as well. Am I right about it? And you're waiting for this kingdom that you're observing. You're waiting for the day that God's going to come and God's going to change your circumstance. God's going to change what's happening in your mind. God's going to change what's happening in your finances. God's going to change what's happening in this now, baby. God is waiting on you to awaken and realize who you are. God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Your lack of knowledge is what you need. You need knowledge, baby. Listen, you ain't waiting for God to just come in and do everything. Listen to me. God's waiting for you to grow up. God is waiting for you to wake up. God's waiting for you to step up. God's waiting for you to rise up, arise, shine. Your light has come. There's a lot of us that have blindfolds on, not knowing we're in rooms full of light. A lot of us do not understand that the light of God is in your vicinity. And the light of God is in your vicinity, but you're blinded. Am I right about it? You're not aware that you're in a light place. You're not aware that God wants to lift you up. You're not aware that God wants to touch you. You're not aware that God wants to deliver you. You're not aware that God wants to, to uh, transition you. Am I right about it? And you're waiting for God to do your job. But I want you to be aware that the Holy Spirit has given you newness of life. Baby, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you and the Holy Spirit brings the kingdom. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not... Uh, eating and drinking, but the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Baby, you're right with God because of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have peace now. You're not an enemy of God. Am I right about it? There was a time, baby, where God was my enemy. There was a time where I was in the world. I was afraid of God. There was a time, baby, where I was afraid to face God, but now because the Holy Spirit is inside of me, I'm not afraid to face God, but he's my friend. Am I right about it? Not only is he my friend, he's my father. Am I right about it? Not only is he my father, he's my refuge. Am I right about it? Not I want to see my refuge. He's my strong tower. Am I right about it? And listen to me, the Holy Spirit begins to bring this peace that I can have with God that I never had before. Am I right about it? Then he brings a joy. What was joy? Joy is when you don't have no evidence it's going to work out, but you know it will. And you can rejoice because you know who you serve. Joy is rejoicing. You have to learn how to rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice in the Lord. Now I want you to be aware. The Holy Spirit brings newness of life because you have the Holy Spirit he changes you from the inside out. Baby, the Holy Spirit begins to transition you. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You're new. Nothing about you is the same before Christ. And what happens to a lot of us, a lot of us, we want to mix the new and the old. You know, who you used to be before you got saved. No, no, no. Who you used to be before you came to Jesus. Well, who you were in the world. Let that go. As long as you're identifying who you used to be, you can never be the new you. And that's a lot of our problem. We still have ties to the old us. Man, I remember, no, no, forget that. The Bible says forget things that are behind. Your future is always brighter than your past. So why do we keep talking about the past? If God has planned this glorious future for you, why do we have to reminisce? Let's talk about that. Why are you reminiscing about your past? When God has a brighter future for you. Why are you talking about who you used to be in the world? Why are you talking about old memories when God says forget those things? You don't want, The Bible says remember Lot's wife. You remember Lot's wife? She was reminiscing on the past. The angel gave her a deliverance. Am I right about it? A lot of us are like Lot's wife. The, the, we have a, a huge deliverance in front of us. We have a huge promised land. This angel came to deliver Lot's wife. And the Bible says she had one instruction. Don't look back. Whatever you do, don't look back. Because if you look back, you're showing me that you want that. And you can't get to where you're going looking back. And the Bible says that they begin to run, they begin to run. And she looked back. And the Bible says when she looked back, she became a pillar of salt. And there's a lot of us in danger of being a pillar of salt because we won't let our past go. We can't let go what God, we can't let go what God has delivered us from. We can't let go of those old associations. There are too many people. You're still associated with people from your past. Listen to me good. The, the, the old adage is elevation requires separation. You can never be elevated with baggage. Am I right about it? You ever notice that when you get on the plane, it's certain things that can't get on the plane? 
You ever notice that there's a criteria, even in a natural, for elevation, for promotion? And how many know that one of the things that hinder your promotion, are you still connected to people from your past? Right? Because some things, because listen to me good, people from your past bring familiar spirits. I want you to be aware. See, a lot of us, you know, when somebody says, hey, let this person go, let that go, let that go, people just, they, they think you're being mean. Baby, listen, there's a spirit behind that person that's trying to pull you back into who you used to be. And as long as you're connected to who that person, you can't be the new you. You can't be who God has called you to be associating with unbelievers. You can't be who God has called you to be associating with people that are not in, in line with your purpose. You can't be who God has called you to be associated with people that, are, that cannot help you get to your destiny. That cannot encourage you to be the new you. There are some people in your life, they'll tolerate you being the old you. Matter of fact, they'll encourage you for being the old you. And there are other people that are in your life, their mere presence will inspire you to become the new you. And you need to be aware because you need to you need to begin to walk in newness of life. Because a lot of us are still connected to people from our past. Right. And you can hide it. You can you can hide it. You can play around with it, or et cetera. But I want you to be aware that in the eyes of God, you don't qualify for promotion. And as soon as you begin to cut people off, I, I prophesy in the name of Jesus that within 30 days, if you cut people off, there's going to be a tremendous promotion. Not only is it going to be a promotion, but it's going to be a tremendous release and transition. And some of you, I'll say this, some of you can't sleep at night because you're associated with people from the past. And the Holy Ghost bear me witness, as soon as you cut those people off, you're going to sleep like a baby. Listen to me good. All because of associations. The Bible says, don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company, you know, evil company. Who is your company? Who is your company? Who are you looking at? Glory to God, Sonny. Who are you looking at? You know, who, who, who your company, are they evil or are they good? <laughs> the Bible says that a campaign of fools will be destroyed. If you have fools in your vicinity, destruction is inevitable. If you if you have if you're a campaign because this would be good let, let me like I, I finally understand this now I guess I'm getting a little old in the faith Sarc I'm saying oh, this is sarcasm but I guess I'm getting a little old in the faith but I realize the word of God whether you believe it or not it's gonna work for you or against you if you're on the opposite side of the word you're gonna be the living proof that it doesn't that it works <laughs> I remember uh, <laughs> I remember um, you can hear me right Cordell. Cordell, can you hear me? I, I think I could, uh, I mean, I was going to use an example. I remember a long time ago uh, when a situation happened where I went in prayer. I went in prayer about a situation and the Lord began to speak. And when the Lord began to speak, the Lord began to say a verse. He began to say a verse. <laughs> and the Lord began to say, he began to say, poverty and shame comes to him that refuses instruction. Poverty and shame come to him that refuses instruction. And I remember I was praying for I was praying for Cordell in that situation years ago. I was praying for him. And when I was praying for him, the Lord was letting me know that it was nothing I could do because his word was coming to pass. And some of us were praying that situations will change, but we're in disobedience to the word of God. Why would God violate his word to change your situation when you're not obeying him? Help me understand that. Why would God violate his word to change the situation you're not obeying him? Right? So you think about this, you refuse an instruction and because you refuse an instruction, the Bible says that if you refuse an instruction, poverty and shame will come to you. So why am I praying for your finances when you can't take instructions? Why, why am I praying that you don't feel ashamed when you can't take instructions? Why? You're ashamed because somebody told you to do something you didn't listen to and you're in that position, Right. The Bible tells us, and um, the Bible tells us, I want you to be aware, because I believe somebody that God wants to talk to real quick. I want you to be aware, because the Bible tells us in, um, in, in, in Proverbs chapter 1, I want you to be aware that you listen to wisdom. Because the Bible says that wisdom cries out in the streets. Am I right about it? Listen to me good. Wisdom is always speaking. Wisdom is always speaking. The voice of God is the voice of wisdom. And the voice of God can come through an unbeliever if it's wisdom. Always remember, wisdom is the voice of God. So when wisdom begins to come, God is speaking. And what begins to happen in certain situations, wisdom comes. And the Bible says that 
She cries out to the simple. There, some of us are simple. What is simple? We're naive. You know, if you're young, you know, be humble. You know, I'm, I'm 25, so I can be humble. Listen to me good. I have life against me. Let, me. let me explain that. I have life against me. I'm 25 years old. Lord willing, Lord willing, I have about anywhere between um, 50 to 65, 75 years left. Glory to God. You know, Lord willing. Now, watch this. If that be true, that means there's someone on the earth who has, let's say if someone is 75, they have 50 years of experience on me. So as a young man, what do I need most? I need wisdom. That's why I read Proverbs all the time. Why? Because it gives to the young man wisdom. I need wisdom. Somebody has an experience I don't have that if I listen to them, I won't have to go through what they had to go through. Some of us don't listen to people. And because you don't listen, you're going through the same things in life because you won't listen. And because you won't listen, you're positioning yourself for wisdom to mock you. The Bible says that wisdom will mock you in the day of your calamity. Some of us want wisdom after we fail. No, 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 baby. Listen to wisdom before you get in that experience. And that wisdom will prevent your failure. That wisdom will prevent your downfall. But a lot of us, we don't listen to wisdom. Right, we want to do it our way. I, you know, I gotta learn. No, 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 baby. Listen to me. Some people say experience is the best teacher. That that's garbage. That's the wisdom of the world. Listen to me good. If you think experience is the best teacher, that's foolishness with God. One more time. If you think wisdom is the best teacher, that's foolishness with God. Wisdom is not ex, no 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 experience is not the best teacher. If you think experience is the best teacher, that's foolishness with God. The best, the best, um, listen to me good. The best thing to do is listen. Listening is the best teacher. Because if you listen, certain experiences you'll never have. I'm right about it. But, you know, it's two ways people pain, change. Uncoming mentors or uncoming pain. Some people, they need pain to change. Some people ain't going to change till they hurt. Some people not going to change till they hit rock bottom. And, and some people, we think, we think that our rock bottom is their rock bottom now, baby. Listen to me. Your rock bottom may be, you know, you lose your job. Some people may have to lose everything for them to change, and that's just how it goes. Because the Bible says their ways will correct them. Some people, you know, some people's ways will correct them. Your ways will correct you. What does that mean? That means the way you are, if you keep going down that path, the pain of your ways will force you to change. The pain of your ways will force you to change. The Bible says there are ways. Some of us, we're praying for people to change. We're just like, oh, man, I hope they get it. No, no, baby. Their ways will correct them. Their ways will. They're just Their ways will correct them. Their ways. The Bible says you, they'll get the fruit of their ways. Some people, the fruit of their ways will change them. The fruit of their ways. And your, your pain threshold may be lower than theirs. There's something, it's just certain things I just can't take. You know, my pain, my pain tolerance is low for certain things. So it don't, it don't require a lot for me to change as it relates to pain. But some people, it take everything. They lose their house, they lose their job, they lose their family, and then, then they, they change. Not bad. But why I'm talking about this? Because I'm talking about newness of life because I want you to understand why Jesus came. The Bible says the thief comes but to steal and to kill and destroy he said, but I've come that you might have a life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give you a life that you've never had before. And if you have the same life, you're living beneath your inheritance. If you have the same life you had before salvation, you don't know who you are. If you have the same life that, you know, you if you had the same life that you had before salvation, you're not walking in the light of God's word. There should be something different about you. The Bible says there were people that looked at Jesus, that, that you looked at their face and they said, these people have been with Jesus. Who can tell you've been with Jesus? You, you ever notice there's always a difference. You can tell who's, when someone is with Jesus or not. I, I know Tony knows for sure. She can tell the difference between when I'm with Jesus, when I'm spending time with Jesus, and when I'm not. Why? Because people that don't spend time with Jesus are more, are more prone to be fleshly and carnal. What does that mean? They're more irritated. They're more frustrated. Everything bothers them. You got to walk on eggshells around them, etc. Why? Because they're not walking in their inheritance. Listen to me good one more time. If you're not living, if your life is the same before salvation, then you're living beneath your inheritance. You don't know who you are. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are new. And all things are of God. I want you to understand, everything is about God now. I want you to understand, you got to be awakened to righteousness and sin not. 
You got to be awakened to righteousness. Some of us, you want stuff to change. God is saying, wake up. The word of the Lord to a lot of you is wake up. When are you going to awaken to who you are? When are you going to awaken to what God has called you to do? When are you going to awaken to your position in Christ? Awake to righteousness. Some of us, you have a list of rules that I'm not going to do this, not going to do that, not going to do this, not going to do that, not going to do this, not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that. You have a lot of rules not to sin. But the key to not sin is to awake to righteousness. When you awake to what's right, you'll stop sinning. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. This I say to your shame. It's not about rules. It's about consciousness. Listen to me good. It's not about rules. It's about consciousness. The Bible says this. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The reason that you're not living the life you want to live, you don't have a lot of grace and peace. You don't have a lot of, the, the more knowledge you have about God, the more grace and peace you'll walk in. Any person that does not have peace lacks knowledge. You know, so when you feel like you're losing your peace, you need to, you need to um, replenish your knowledge. You need to go remind yourself of who you are. You need to be reminded of what God has done. You need to be reminded of this gospel. See, this glorious gospel in which this gospel of grace this gospel of grace in which we stand. I want you to be aware that we. the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. By whom also we have access by faith in his grace where we stand. Listen, we're, good. we're standing in the grace of God right now. Right now, you're standing in the grace of God by faith. You're in a position you can never earn. You're in a position you can never work for. You're in a position you can never deserve. You're in a, listen to me, Jesus took what you deserved and he gave you what he deserved. Listen to me good. Jesus took what you deserve. You deserve death. You deserve punishment for your sins. You deserve hell. Jesus took all of that and gave you what he deserved. I want you to be aware. That's the grace of God. What's the grace of God? Jesus took what you deserve and gave you what he deserves. You deserve death. He gave you life. You deserve hell. He gave you heaven. You deserve bondage. He gave you liberty. You deserve poverty. He gave you riches. You deserve sickness. He gave you health. You deserve confusion. He gave you peace. You deserve um, uncertainty. He gives you direction. You deserve foolishness. He gives you wisdom. I'm right about it. You deserve to you you uh, listen to me good. You deserve to be damaged. He makes you whole. Listen to all the things he gives you. And a lot of us we have not awakened to what we have and who we are. So we're living so beneath. We're living so beneath what God has for us. We're living so beneath it. So beneath it. But God has given us something so glorious. God has given us something so wonderful. God has given us something so awesome. Am I right about it? Now, be aware because we're going to go to Romans chapter 6. Is it helping anybody so far? You guys being blessed by this? Because I want to stir you guys up. There's a word from the Lord that God wants me to stir you guys up. Watch this, verse 1. In Romans 6, it says, listen to me, God. It says, what, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in grace? I mean, sin, that grace may abound. God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized until his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So let me go ahead and do this. Let me, let me make you aware of something. Listen to me good. You were baptized into Christ Jesus. I'm not talking about when, you know, baptism is not when a man takes you into water. That's secondary. Listen to me good. It's no good for a man to take you into water if the Holy Spirit has not done something first. <laughs> Some people just go down a, 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 a dry center and they come up a wet center. There's been no heart change. There's, never, there's not been an exchange. There's not been a, a taking away of the heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh. Am I right about it? His laws and his, his laws have not been written in their heart and their mind. Am I right about it? He has not found them to be a dwelling place. Am I right about it? Their body is not the temple of the Holy Ghost. Am I right about it? But what, what begins to happen when you begin to confess on the name of Jesus, when you begin to say, Lord, I accept you in my life, when you say, Jesus, your Lord and Savior of my life, when you say, I believe in what you've done. When you say I repent and I, I, I repent of my sins and you say I accept this gift of righteousness, what begins to happen as soon as you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, the Holy Spirit takes you and the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. The first baptism is the body of Christ. 
Everything else comes after that. Every other baptism comes after that. Am I right about it? There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The baptism that matters the most is that you've been baptized into the body of Christ. When you accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ and makes you a member of this body. Am I right about it? And then what begins to happen is when you're baptized into the body of Christ, you've been baptized into his death. I want you to imagine Jesus on the cross. When you were baptized into the body, you entered into the, the crucifixion on the cross. You were crucified with Christ. You identify with that crucifixion. What does that mean? It means that when you become a believer, the power of sin is broken over your life. Not only is the power of sin broken over your life, but also the consequences of sin is broken. So when you accept Jesus, he takes away the penalty and the power of sin. You get forgiveness and deliverance. Am I right about it? He delivers you from the power of sin. Now, you're no longer a slave to sin, but you're a slave to righteousness. You are a slave to do the right thing. Am I right about it? Watch this. But when you're baptized into this death, watch this. Jesus didn't just stay dead. This is where a lot of, this is where a lot of us um, stay. And this is what I want to awaken you to today. A lot of us, we stay in a place. But Jesus didn't just die and stay dead. <laughs> Everybody wants to talk about overcoming sin. Listen to me good. It's not just about overcoming sin. He's done that for you. It's about walking in newness of life. Listen to me good. To, to make Christianity about avoiding sin is the equivalent of Jesus just dying and staying in the tomb. To make Christianity about just overcoming sin will be the same thing as Jesus just staying in the tomb. That's it. Listen to me good. Jesus didn't just stay in the tomb. But the Bible says that I want you to I want you to be aware of something. Jesus was raised by the credo power, kratos power of God. Listen to good. Let's see if you have what's called dunamis power. Dunamis power is dynamite power. What's dynamite? You know, dynamite, what we use to explosive, the explosive power of God. Listen to be good. Jesus was not raised by the dunamis. <laughs> he was raised by the kratos. What's the difference between dunamis and kratos? Du dunamis is the power to enforce obedience. It's, 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 the, it's the gun of the police officer. That's dunamis. Listen to me good. Jesus was not raised by the, the dunamis powers. He was raised by the kratos. So listen to me good. I want you to get something, and this is so powerful. Listen to me good. When Jesus was in the tomb, when he, had, when he had went to heaven, I mean, when he went to hell, and Jesus plundered the devil. Listen to me good. Listen to me good. Jesus defeated the devil for you. Jesus stripped them of all their power. They, Jesus stripped them and beat them to a place where they had nothing left to turn to. When, when the victory was secured in hell and the father said the time is now, he began to um, raise Jesus from the dead. And I want you to be aware. Let me tell you what happens. Watch this. I want you to imagine the body of Jesus in the tomb. And I want you to imagine that the father says, now it's time to erase him from the dead, to resurrect him from the dead. And I want you to imagine that all the power of God in the universe fills that tomb. And I want you to imagine the presence of God filling that place. And I want you to imagine every inch of that tomb being filled with God's presence. And I want you to be aware that that, power, that, that presence was so powerful that people outside of the tomb fell on their face as if they were dead. And I want you to imagine that power was so strong that they could not get up. I want you to imagine that that power was so strong they could not get up. Not only was it so strong they couldn't give up, they couldn't get up, but it was so strong that what God wanted to happen had to happen before they could move. They couldn't move. They were like dead men on the ground. This is Kratos' power of God. They were dead men on the ground. Listen to me good. And not only was that power so strong that they were dead men on the ground, they were like dead men on the ground, the power of God began to fill that tomb and the power of God began to um, permeate every pore of Jesus' skin. And then the power of God began to go into every cell of his body. Every muscle, every tissue, every fiber, every organ, every organ system, am I right? every bone. And the power of God began to infuse him with life. And the power of God began to infuse his body with life. And he was filled with life. And when Jesus arose from the dead, the Kratos power of God filled his entire being. And I want you to be aware, that same Kratos power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that changes you. 
The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is called the resurrection power of God. The resurrection power of God is responsible for your change. The Holy Spirit wants to permeate every fiber of your being. The Holy Spirit wants to change the way you think. The Holy Spirit wants to change the way you speak. The Holy Spirit wants to change the way you live. The Holy Spirit wants to change your finances. The Holy Spirit wants to change your self-image. He wants to change every single fiber of your being. And once you surrender to the Kratos power of God by fellowship with Jesus, you begin to walk in newness of life. Your relationship with God is what changes you, not rules. A lot of us don't change because we want to change ourselves. How can the potter change? How can the clay change itself? I thought a potter was responsible for the clay. So we get into a lot of self-help things. Now, knowledge is very necessary. Knowledge is needful. Knowledge is necessary. The Bible, matter of fact, the Bible says it's not good for a soul to be without knowledge. That's why a lot of us break down because we don't have knowledge. It's not good for your mind. It's not good for your will. Not good for your emotions to not have knowledge. It's not good for a soul to be without knowledge. It's bad. It's, it's horrible when you don't have knowledge. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Knowledge gives you the power. Knowledge increases your strength. Some of us are weak because we don't have knowledge. We don't have knowledge. But when you don't have knowledge, you're weak. When you don't have knowledge, you're limited. When you don't have knowledge, you're hindered. But I want you to be aware that God has called you to walk in newness of life. Verse 5, Romans 6, 5. Watch this. It says, for we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. So we, 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 a lot of us, we identify with his death. We say, hey, I've died. Jesus died for my sins. We identify with his death. But can you identify with his resurrection? Can you say that Jesus has changed your life? Can you say right now that you're going from faith to faith and glory to glory? Can you say you're experiencing more victories than defeats? Can you say that Jesus is Lord over your mind, your will, your emotions? Can you say that you feel the Kratos power of God at work in your entire being? Can you say that the Kratos power of God is changing everything about you? Because you shouldn't just be planted in the likeness of his death. Let's talk about resurrection. You know, God don't want you to just die without being raised again. If you die to anger, you're going to be raised up to temperance. If you die to, to harshness, you're going to be raised up to gentleness. Whatever you die in, it's a resurrection coming. How many resurrections have you experienced since you've been saved? How many resurrections? You, you should have you should have uh, you should have a multitude of resurrections. What can you say you died to and was raised up again? What can you say you died to and was raised up again? Have you died to your anger? Have you died to your impatience? Some of us are so impatient we can't take nothing. All it takes is a stuff not to go the way we wanted to go, and and we can't take it. We have you died to impatience? What would be the opposite of impatience? You had to be raised up to patience. Can you stay the same under pressure? If pressure changes you, you're not patient. Pressure should not change you. Only God should. You should be able to rule your own spirit. The Bible says by patience, possess your soul. You, you got to rule your spirit through patience. You got to be able to stay the same no matter what. When we have the up and down, you know, the ups and downs, I'm up, I'm down. Up. When you're up and down, it's because you don't have patience. Patience is when you're the same no matter the circumstances. Patience is what causes you to possess your soul. When you have patience, the devil will not be able to affect your soul. You possess your soul. You take rule over your soul. You take ownership over your soul by being patient. What does that mean? Pa Listen to me. A lot of us think patience is waiting. I'm just going to wait on God. Nah, baby, that's not patience. That's not patience. I'm just waiting on God. Nah, baby, that's, that's religion. No, 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 no. The Bible don't talk about waiting. When the Bible say waiting on the Lord, it's not waiting like you thinking. When you tell when the Bible say waiting on the Lord, it's not waiting. It's waiting. Look, <laughs> when the Bible says wait on the Lord, it's not waiting. It's waiting. You see this? It's waiting. It's waiting. You finna serve Him when you get in His presence and you wait on the Lord. Lord, what you want me to do? Lord, where you want me to go? Lord, who you want me to touch? Lord, what do I need to change? When you wait on the Lord, He'll renew your strength. You gotta wait on Him, not wait on Him. I ain't somebody wait. I'm talking about wait on him. Serve the Lord. When you serve the Lord, when you serve him, when you minister to God in his presence, when you spend time with God, he infuses you with his strength. He takes your weaknesses and he gives you his strength. There's an exchange that begins to happen. But patience is not waiting. Patience is endurance. Patience means don't give up. 
That's what that means. What is, it means do not give up. To be patient means that God has promised you an outcome and you refuse to quit. You refuse to give up. You refuse to submit to a lower outcome because you have a promise. Patience is needed to get your promises. Whatever God has promised you, you got to be patient to get it. You got to say, I'm not going to give up. You got to say, hey, I'm not going to give in. Why? Because patience is how you possess your promises. A lot of us, you know, you, you've done the will of God. You, you ever, you ever, I've been in that place. I can speak for myself. You ever been in a place where you've done the will of God and nothing is happening? You know, I, that sounds blasphemous, don't it? How can I do God's will and nothing happen? The Bible says it. The Bible says after you've done the will of God. It's something you got to do after you do God's will. How many of us do God's will? I'm right about it. How many of us do God's will? You know, you, you ever done the will of God? Uh, you done the will of God and it seemed, you ever prayed and it seemed like nothing happened? You ever gave and it seemed like nothing happened? You ever forgave and it seemed like nothing happened? You ever walked in love and it seemed like nothing happened? Am I right about it? The Bible says after you've done the will of God, it's something you need. Am I right about it? It says after you've done the will of God, you have need of patience so that you can receive the promise. Some of us, it's not that you're not doing God's will. Is that you give up too quick. You grow weary and well-doing. The Bible says, don't grow weary and well-doing. For in due season you will reap if you faint not. Not fainting is patience. Patience is when you don't give up. When you give up, it's because you lack patience. And prayer gives you the power not to give up. I said prayer gives you the power not to give up. Prayer gives you the power. So it's not that you're not doing God's will because there was a time, even recently, where the devil was working on my mind. He was trying to affect my mind to think that certain things I was doing was not working. And the issue was not that what I was doing was not working. It's once you do what God says do, you got to not give up. You got to persevere no matter what. You got to keep going until you see what was promised. Patience is to refuse to stop, to refuse to give up. To refuse to become discouraged because you know that if you keep going, you'll get your promise. See, some of us, we do God's will. The Bible says, if any man suffering, let him pray. We pray and we pray, thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. And you look around and nothing has changed. Why? You didn't keep going. Keep going. Keep doing it. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't faint. Don't quit. Am I right about it? Because you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you got to persevere. Whenever you do what God has said, don't give up until you see what's promised. If God says do something, do it. And once you do it, do not give up until you see the manifestation of your promise. Patience guarantees you receive. See, a lot of the body of Christ, they, they teach a lot on faith at the expense of patience. They teach you how to believe and they act like it's instant. Right now, you know, you, you believe for a car, let's pray. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, by faith, you got it. Amen. Okay. And you you doing the will of God. You confessing, you praying, you believe in God. By faith, you got it. Okay. Teach the people not to give up. Teach the people persecution is coming. Teach the people the devil is going to try to oppose them. Teach the people that you got to resist the devil steadfast in the faith. Teach the people the adversary goes to like a roaring light seeking who he may devour. Teach the people not to faint. Teach the people the power of prayer. Teach the people that prayer gives you energy not to give up. It's not just about faith. It's about patience. Faith and patience are the power twins. You need patience to undergird your faith. Patience will strengthen your faith. Listen to me good. I said patience will strengthen your faith. You got to believe God. You got to believe God because God is glorious and his word is true. So I just want to encourage you guys that there's a brand new life that God has called you into. And I want you to be aware of what God has purpose and what God has ordained because there's a brand new life that God has called you to. God has called you into a brand new life. And if you want to walk in newness of life, baby, you got to surrender fully to God. You got to begin to believe God. You got to learn how to have faith. You got to learn how to have patience. You got to not give up when times get hard. Listen, if you do anything for God, times are going to get hard. If you do anything for God, times are going to get rough. The issue, the old adage here, they say, when, you know, when um, they say when the when the times get tough, the tough gets going. Right. You got to you got to you got to match the level of resistance you're experiencing. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. When the devil is assaulting you, you got to match him. You got to match him in fervency. You got to match him in perseverance. 
You got to match him in faith. You got to match him with zeal. You got to match him. Am I right about it? Because he going to violently assault you. And, you know, I had a vision about myself a couple of days ago. And the Lord was showing me how my posture in spiritual warfare, that I wasn't enduring strong enough. And I had a vision that I was this bodybuilder, this huge boxer. And I was fighting someone that was that was um, stick skinny. And he was beating me up. And what I, when the vision the Lord was showing me, you're not fighting the way I told you to fight. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking, this vision, this small, skinny man beat me down. And I'm, my hands are up, ready to box. And I'm just bloodied up. And in the vision, it's revealed that if you hit him one time, you can win. And a lot of us, you know, a lot of us, well, a lot of us, what happens to us is we don't know the victory that we already have in Christ. And the devil uses our lack of knowledge to beat us. So he's fighting, you know, like you talk about boxing, you see somebody like, like Tyson, you know, Tyson had a, you know, he had a, he had a, a swagger to him. He had a technique and his technique was to hit you in your stomach. He'll hit you in that weak place because he knew most people didn't, you know, fight, do their stomach. So Mike Tyson would, when he hit, when he hit them in their sides, they would crumple down and their face would be wide open. And the devil is strategically fighting a lot of us. He realizes, hey, she's weak in her confidence. I'm going to hit her there. He's not hitting you in your strong strengths. He's hitting your weaknesses. And you got to realize, you got to awaken to who you are and the power you carry. And once you begin to awaken to your identity in Christ and you awaken to the explosive power that you carry, your life will never be the same. But he's taking advantage of what you don't know about what Jesus has done. And he's taking advantage about what you don't know about yourself. So I would encourage you guys to get knowledge and get knowledge of God's word. Spend time in the New Testament. Spend time reading things that will cause you to grow in faith. Faith comes from, you know, faith comes from hearing God speak to you as you read the Bible. When you read the Bible, there's an impartation of faith that comes when you when you get into the Bible expecting revelation. If you want to be strong in faith, you have to spend time in the word and spend time with God and God will impart faith to you as you spend time in the word and expectation. So I want to encourage you guys to begin to walk in newness of life. Let's no longer just associate with um, the likeness of his death, but let's associate with the likeness of his resurrection. Let's experience this glorious life that God has planned for us. And I pray this blesses you. Listen, if you don't follow me on Periscope, follow me on Periscope, Darnell Craig. God bless you, Quincy. If you don't follow me on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Darnell Craig. And if, if you don't um, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Twitter at underscore all caps, T-O-A-U-M. God bless you, um, Tony. That's my fiance right there. God bless you. Um, God bless you all. I, I should be back on here in a short while. It may be as fast as a couple of minutes or it may be within another hour. So be on the lookout. I got another word that I have to release. So God bless you all. Talk to you guys again soon. Bye-bye.